All right. Um, so this talk is about being a wizard. Um, like, you know how someone, you, sometimes you see someone uh, doing things with the computers and you're like, how did you do that? You're amazing. Um, okay, so uh, computers aren't magic, <laughs> which is a barrier to us being wizards, uh, I think. Um, so instead of talking about uh, magic, we're gonna talk about how do you like learn hard things and understand really complicated systems. Um, I, I, I'm gonna talk about me for a second. Um, my name is Julia. I have a blog, um, and at work I work on a Kubernetes, which is some container thing. It's not important what it is, um, but the, the reason I say this uh, is that like last year I didn't really know what Kubernetes was, and like Eric just gave this great talk about containers, and a year ago I was very fuzzy on the concept of a, of a container, and now it's like my whole job, um, and I'm like now I'm like one of the experts at my company on this thing, which I like barely understood last year. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about like, how do you go from like being like, I don't know what this thing is to like, I manage an extremely important system <laughs> based on this thing. <laughs> and I feel safe doing that and I don't think I'm gonna get fired. Um, so <laughs> um, like I work with, need to work with a bunch of different kinds of technologies, right? Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about like Linux and networking and like TCP and like how does TCP work? Uh, anyway. Um, and uh, we use AWS, and there, if you've ever worked with AWS, you know that there are three bajillion different AWS subservices. Anyway, um, I mean, learned about a whole bunch of different things this year. Um, so, uh, this, my slides are a little, whatever, it's fine, we'll roll with it. Um, right, uh, so I wanna talk about kind of like having this attitude of like, how, like how do you go from being like, oh, I'm bad at this, I don't know how to do it, to like, I can learn this. No problem, I can just be a wizard. Um, so we're gonna talk about like six different skills that I've tried to get better at over the years. Um, so the first one is like understanding your systems and trying to figure out how to understand like really complicated systems, um, which are the ones that we deal with, uh, and how to ask really good questions. We'll talk about reading the code, we'll talk about debugging, and then we're talking talk a little bit about like designing. Um, I'm like, how do you get better at designing systems? Um, okay, so let's start out with understanding your systems first. Um, I'm gonna talk more about like understanding like low-level systems just because that's what I do in my job right now um, because I got excited about like, I was like, I wanna understand the guts of the computers that I work with. <laughs> um, and I wanna know all about like networking and like how that works. Um, so that's what I do now. Uh, but Hopefully some of this will apply to anything, even if you are not like immersed in the details of computer networking and that's not like your dream. Um, okay, so like why is it important to like understand how stuff works? Um, because you can actually get by without understanding how a lot of things work, right? Like it's pretty easy. Um, so one reason I think it's useful is just to understand like jargon. Like if someone says words, like if someone says like user space, like, if you're working with containers, it's, like, useful to know what that means. Or um, if someone uses the word, like, event loop, for example, and you're doing async programming, it's useful to know what an event loop is. Um, but more importantly, I think, um, if you're trying to debug, like, a really tricky problem, uh, I think it's really important to know, like, what lives underneath that problem, right? So, so you're not just, like, what's happening and, like, Googling, sadly, being like, why is error message help? Um, if, you, if, like, if you understand like, what lives beneath the, uh, the systems you're working with, I think it makes it a lot easier to debug things. Um, and another reason I think it's useful um, to understand what you're working on uh, is that it, it can let you like, innovate, right? Like if you wanna build a new library, um, like if you wanna build this cool like, robotics calibration library, um, then you need to really understand the details of how everything underneath it works, right? Um, and I think it's fun to innovate and build cool new stuff for other people to use. Um, okay, um, so like, let's say you have a whole bunch of stuff you wanna learn about and there's this like, huge mountain in front of you um, and you wanna start like, chipping away at it um, to understand <laughs> um, little bits. Um, one thing I really like to do um, is to try to understand just like, fundamentals and be like, okay, I wanna understand like, um, what, 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 what were we learning about? like calibrating robotic systems, and there's this idea of like a, a kinematics model. It's like, what's a kinematics model? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> or like, what are these parameters, like alpha and theta, and like, what do they mean? Um, uh, and like, I like to kind of like, you like start at the beginning, right? And you're like, okay, what does this word mean? Oh no, to understand that word, I need to understand eight other words. Cool, great, <laughs> I'll do that. Um, one thing uh, I did when I was trying to understand TCP and networking um, is, and you can do this as homework if you're excited, <laughs> Um, is I built a TCP stack from scratch in Python, um, and it took me like about a week to do it. Um, and then that helped me understand really exactly how TCP works. Um, and now when I try to debug TCP pro pro programs, I'm like, I know the basics. I did it all myself. <laughs> um, and even though like the networking stack in the kernel, I think is like four million lines of code, and mine was like 200, like. <laughs> Writing like those like 200 lines taught me the basics, right? Um, even if I do not understand like whatever the four million lines of networking code in the Linux kernel. Um, uh, so I, and uh, an another thing I like to do to try to figure stuff out uh, is to do experiments. So like let's say you want to understand a little bit better about how memory management works on your computer, you can just be like, okay, let's just make my computer run out of memory, and see what happens. Um, that could be fun. Um, it turns out that what happens um, is Linux will just start killing things for you. Because um, it'll be like, oh no, there's no more, and it'll just kind of start killing stuff at random, uh, which is exciting. Um, one really exciting thing that can happen is if you, on purpose, uh, run out of memory during a presentation, and then Linux kills your presentation software, and it makes a very dramatic end to... <laughs> to your talk, <laughs> um, which is not a real thing I did, but it's just a real thing that I partnered in on purpose, and I think it was like a, a majestic work of performance art. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, I, think, I think it's fun to see things happening instead of just like reading, them, reading about them in a textbook, right? And it's just a computer, right? Like, you probably won't screw it up that badly. Um, <laughs> I haven't managed to ruin it yet. Um, uh, another kind of experimental thing I did was I tried to write an operating system. Um, I realized rapidly that that was impossible, slash would take too much time. Um, so I settled for just writing a keyboard driver to figure out exactly what happens when you press J on your keyboard and it displays to the screen. And now I know. Um, and I was really happy. Um, uh, so I have like some rules of programming experiments that I apply, uh, which are like I don't really require any of them to be good, right? Because it doesn't, it's not important that like it'd be like good code and doesn't necessarily like have to work that well. Like I wrote this uh, TCP stack in Python and I could like make network requests to Google through it and Google would reply to me um, and it would send me a, a, a like it would send me a response, and then after that things would kind of go wrong, and Google would like be like, "What are you doing?" And then it would disconnect me. <laughs> um, but it was fine, right? Like I, I I managed to like send my request to Google and get a response back, and then things went wrong. Um, but I was I was like still so happy with myself, um, and I like learned a lot um, about how TCP worked, uh, and I thought that was cool. Um, another thing I like to do is read books. Some books are really good. Um, I like reading networking books. So there's a book I like called Networking for System Administrators. Even though I'm not a system administrator, I learned a lot from it. Um, uh, and another thing that I think is kind of like useful is to actually like read things that are kind of too hard, where you read it and you're like, I don't understand what many of the words mean <laughs> in this. Um, like there's this website called Jepson.io, which does a lot of like database analysis. So it looks at databases like MongoDB um, or Elasticsearch or um, a lot of others. And then it tries to like break them. And then it's like, I did this and then the database broke and it didn't work properly. And I'm like, what? Why? What's happening? Should I be worried? Like if I'm using that database? Um, and so I think, I think this is a really cool website. Um, and I like reading the articles in part because they're kind of hard to read. Um, and I've learned a lot by like reading them and looking at the terms. Um, and of course, like it's one way to learn about new concepts is to work with them in your job, even if you're not quite sure what they are. Um, so, or like sometimes even, so like once I needed to work with, we have a, a HTTP proxy that we used to like send requests to the outside world. Um, 
And I kind of thought I knew what an HTTP pro proxy was, but then someone was like, oh, Julia, can you add some logging to it? Um, so I did, and then I found out that I actually didn't understand it that well, and I learned much more about how an HTTP proxy works exactly, and I learned that it was harder than I thought. So like, and that's kind of one of my favorite things, actually, is what, like, when I go to like, work with something that I thought I knew, and then I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't know this. Like, that's exciting. Um, and like, um, so this happens to me constantly, right, is that I think I understand something, and then I learn a new thing, and I'm like, oh, no, I don't understand this. Um, and I feel like if you want to like, get really good at the systems you're working with, I think it's important to like, actually be like, no, why doesn't this work? I'm going to figure it out. Um, and like, actually like, dig into the problem. Um, so like, for example, uh, I had a machine recently which was swapping. Like, so uh, it was like writing memory to disk instead of like, well, instead of not doing that, right? It started swapping memory to disk, um, but it was only using like 12% of its available memory. So I was like, why are you swapping? Computer, that's stupid. Like, you have like three gigabytes of memory left. I don't understand. Um, and I could have like just left it at that because um, it didn't really seem to be causing that big of a problem. So I was like, this is probably fine, I guess. Um, but then I decided to actually learn what was going on. And I figured out that there's like actually like four different reasons that a computer can swap, um, which are that like it could be actually out of RAM or it could just be mostly out of RAM. And like depending on the VM.swappiness setting, then it'll start swapping anyway. Um, or you could, have a, you could be using containers, which is the problem with me. Um, <laughs> Containers give you a lot of new classes of problems which didn't exist before, um, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> so here my machine had lots of RAM, but the container was out of RAM, and so it decided to swap, which is kind of dumb. Um, or you can have like a bad, anyway, these reasons are, pr you're probably not excited about all the different reasons a computer could swap, um, but I feel like the equivalent of this for whatever thing you actually are interested in can be kind of cool, right? Because you're like, oh, wait, there are so many more. Like, there's like this universe of things that I didn't know about. Um, this is great. Oh, yeah, specifically for swapping, there is a 600-page book, page book about understanding the Linux Virtual Memory Manager, um, if that's something you want. <laughs> and it has 200 pages of docs and then also 400 pages of code references where you can read the Linux kernel code for the Virtual Memory Manager, um, if that's something you want. Um, I've been trying to learn more about Linux internals a little bit on and off for the last like four years. Before that, I used Linux for like 10 years. Um, so like, I think trying to understand complicated systems takes a really long time. Because um, like my mom bought me a computer in 2003, and then I decided to install a lot of Linux distributions on it, because that was what I did when I was 15, apparently. Um, and then I learned what a system call was in 2013. Um, anyway. Okay. Let's talk about asking questions. Asking questions is one of my favorite things, and I feel like it's an, an important skill because I often like have all these great people around me who know a lot of things that I don't know, and they're for, they're not just gonna like tell me, like I mean sometimes they 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 are just like Julia, did you know about how TLS works? And I'm like, I think so, but I'm not sure. And then like like sometimes people will at lunch just like decide to tell me stuff, um, which is great, uh, but usually I have to ask them first. Um, so, um, the, I think of like the goal of asking questions. Like, it's like, what is a good question, right? I feel like a good question is one where I ask you a question, and then it's like really easy for you to answer that question. Like, you're, you can answer me right away um, because you understood the question and you know the answer, and then I learn really quickly. Because, right? So, you want to ask questions which are like easy to answer. So, how do you like come up with a question which is easy to answer? Um, so, my favorite first thing to do to ask a question that's easy to answer is to like say what I know. So, like, um, let's say I'm asking a question about databases. I could say like, oh, if you like write a lot of data to your database, sometimes the hard drive can't handle it, um, and then you have problems. So, and then the person might be like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, but maybe there are some edge cases there. Uh, and so this is cool. Um, 
I like to do this because it helps me to organize my thoughts. Um, also because it helps me like reveal things that I don't that, that I don't understand. Because sometimes I'll be like, I know like X Y Z, and people will be like, not quite. Like <laughs> you, the you X and Y are right, but like Z is like not not super right. Um, and then this is also good because it helps you like avoid answers that are like too basic slash like too advanced, right? Um, because it's kind of a waste of time if I'm like, tell me about like, I don't know, databases, and someone's like, well, there's this language called SQL, and I'm like, I know about SQL. That's not. I had a more complicated question or a less complicated question. Um, Another thing I like to do is to avoid asking like always the most experienced person um, because like I think what happens a lot is sometimes you'll have someone who knows a lot of things and then everyone will just ask them all of the questions um, and that can be kind of like tiring for them um, and like not a very efficient use of resources because you just have, kind of have like uh, like too much resource contention on that one person. Um, so what I, I like to do sometimes is like try to find like maybe a less wizardy person who I think will still probably know the answer to my question, um, and then it gives them some like more experience answering questions um, and helps them like build up their knowledge a little bit even, um, and then I'll probably get the answer to the question I have anyway, um, and then it saves the other person who is constantly being bombarded with questions some time. Um, yeah, that's why. Um, another thing which is good to do, which I think you hear a lot about, um, is to, like do research. Right, and be like, okay, I will Google the word like kinematic model first <laughs> to try to understand what it means. Um, I have not yet Googled the word kinematic model, uh, so I, I should do that um, before asking questions about it, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, and then you can be like, well, when I Googled, I found out this, and now I have a question. <laughs> Now that I've figured out a couple of things. Um, okay, so I was talking about <laughs> kinematic models. Um, I, 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 I thought this talk was super cool about like calibrating robots, um, and I like learned a lot from it, and it was a super good talk, right? Right? Um, <laughs> um, uh, but like one, one thing that happens, I think, to maybe most of us, certainly to me a lot, is I'll like find something I'm interested in, um, and that I want to know more about. But sometimes I'm like deeply confused about the whole space. Like, um, and I'll have like, like let's say like with containers. When I started learning about containers, I was like, what's a container? What's happening? I don't know, like, can you have more than one process in a container? Or is it possible to have two processes in a container? Is a container even a real thing? Um, or is it a fake thing? Like, do you need to have Docker to use containers? Um, and for me, I feel like asking, like trying to split like my confusion um, into like yes or no questions really helps me because I, I can, you can be like, okay, um, can you have more than one process in a container, right? And the answer is yes. And then it's like, can you run more than one operating system on your computer at the same time? Like, can you run like Ubuntu and then also like Red Hat at the same time? And then the answer is also yes, which is weird. And then you're like, okay, cool. And then you like assemble, like, I, uh, then I can like assemble these facts about the world, and I can be like, okay, how can I like build a, a model of the world which makes all these like yes or no questions make sense? Um, and I feel like that, that that helps take me from being like I am deeply confused to like at least I am a little better oriented. Um, yeah. Um, and also, yes or no questions are easy to answer, right? Because the answer is either like yes or no. Usually, um, or sometimes like your question is malformed, <laughs> like that question didn't even make sense. Um, but I, like I actually feel like the the skill of being able to like answer like ask like a well formed question um, even when you're confused is like something you can develop. Um, like I attempted to ask a question about kinematic models in this talk, <laughs> which I hope was well formed, and then I got a really good answer. Thank you. <laughs> it, it was so good. Hi. Okay, new question asking technique. Um, sometimes someone will do something that you don't understand. Um, uh, right, so sometimes someone will do something and you, you like won't understand how they did that. Um, 
So what I like to do is just feel like, as soon as someone does something that I want to know how they did it, I'll just be like, how did you do that? Can I watch? Can I see? <laughs> Please explain. Um, I, I, yeah, ideally not too, like a too intrusive way, but I find that that really helps me. Um, and another thing I like to do, especially as I become more like senior, um, is ask questions in public, right? And to, to like not just like ask someone secretly while like hiding behind the couch, like how did you do that? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> like instead, I'll just be like go into our public Slack channel and be like, I don't understand what this is. Can you help, right? <laughs> or like, can you explain how you did that? Um, and like. I think that especially like as someone who's like more senior or like more of a leader, it's really important to do that because um, then it like opens up space for less senior people to a ask questions too. Um, okay, we're done with asking questions. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is reading the code um, and like especially like reading the code because we all have all this open source that we work with, right? Um, and the delightful thing about open source is that you can read the code for all of it, and then learn things. Um, so this is cool because it lets you, um, one, one, of, one of my favorite uh, reasons to read the code is just that I'll get an error message, and that error message will be completely unhelpful. Like, it'll be like, the thing is broken, and I'm like, thanks. Like, <laughs> but then you cannot correct that person's choice to make the error message, it's broken, in the past, so you can just like, grab the code base for like it's broken and then try to figure out like what actually happened. Um, so that's awesome. Um, I think like reading the code has also helped me get around just like problem, general problems with documentation a lot um, because a lot of things, especially like when you're in some weird edge case, um, are like really not well documented. Um, but then if you just go read it, you can see how it works. Um, one example of this actually um, is Recently, someone wrote a blog post about async IO in Python, and they were asking for someone to review it, and it had a bunch of like facts in it, right? Like it was like, oh, async IO does this or does that, and I wanted to like fact check some of them, um, just because I was interested. Um, but then when I tried to Google to fact check these like facts about async IO, I couldn't figure it out. Um, so I was like, well, async IO has code, so I can just read it. Um, and so I, like, I went into async IO and tried to like, start figuring out how it worked, and it turned out to be totally readable, um, which I thought was really great. Um, so like, async IO has this event loop where like, um, it'll like, do the loop, do a thing, and then come back to the beginning. Um, and uh, you can interpret event loop in a pretty literal, literal way, right? which is that there's a loop, and there is a loop. This is it. This is while true. Do the thing. <laughs> And um, then if it's stopping, and then th this, this goes on for quite a while, right? Like this is in a 1400 line file. Um, but I thought it was cool that even with like, I mean, async I was like part of core, core Python. It's like not the simplest library. It's a few thousand lines of code. Um, but I could just go in and start reading it and figure out what was going on. Um, and I, like the more you do this, and, I think, and the more you practice like reading unfamiliar libraries, the better you get at it. And I feel like it's really like kind of a wizard skill to be able to be like, this code is completely undocumented, and I have a question, and I need to know the answer to this question, and I can just go figure it out. Uh, no problem. Uh, what do you need? Um, and I, I, I think I really learned this from like my first boss. Um, where I was working with Drupal, which is this like PHP web framework, um, and I would ask him like, "How does this work? I don't understand." And he'd be like, "Julia, you just have to go read the code. Like, there's these docs you're looking for don't exist, right? It's not, it's not happening." <laughs> um, okay, so we're done reading the code. Let's talk about debugging. Um, debugging is one of my favorite things. Uh, the reason, one reason I think debugging is so good, especially like for getting better as a programmer, um, is that when you're debugging, I think you're often in a place where like, especially if you're spending a long time debugging something, you're in a place where there's something you don't understand, right? Because if you understood, you would have fixed the bug already, probably. Um, so if you're really stuck, there's probably something, like a learning opportunity there somewhere. Um, so, I'm actually, okay. Like, I think I've gotten a lot better at debugging over time, and I was thinking about how I got better at it. Um, so, thing, way one, 
um, is to remember that your bug is happening for a logical reason. Um, because often I'll see a bug and I'm like, that's not possible. That can't happen. I coded it. It was not supposed to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, of course, there's always a reason, right? Um, like sometimes that reason, my friend has a really good debugging story. Um, my friend Allison has a good debugging story about how like sometimes the reason is that your memory is being corrupted. Like, and she would have, <laughs> she, she, was, she was working uh, with these like really old Windows uh, machines, like very, very, very old, and which had really bad RAM. And so their memory would get corrupted and then they would send back corrupted memory. Um, but that's still a logical reason. Like, <laughs> uh, if, uh, unlikely. Um, and so I think, I think it's helpful to remember that, that there's always a reason. Because um, otherwise you start to think of those gremlins. And it's like a very unhelpful uh, train of thought. Um, uh, another thing that helps me is to like, be confident that I can actually fix the bug. This is relevant um, because sometimes I try to fix bugs, which will take me like days or weeks to fix. Um, and so I feel like it would be kind of embarrassing if I spent like two weeks trying to fix a bug and then I couldn't do it. Because then I would have to be like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I just like wasted two weeks. Um, but uh, in practice, I'm usually able to fix the bugs that I set out to fix, um, even if it sometimes takes me three weeks. Um, like once I tried to fix this like Hadoop MapReduce like data processing job that was taking way too long to run. Um, and then I just kind of like worked on it for a long time. And then eventually I fixed it and it was super fast. Um, while doing that actually, this, this was kind of interesting. Um, so this job was processing like a thousand records, records, records a second, right? And a thousand things a second kind of seems like a lot. Um, uh, another thing I found out is that floating point exponentiation is really slow. So if you take like a floating point number and raise it to the power of a number, um, that's like a very slow operation, kind of shockingly. Um, and like this job was actually spending like 98% it's, like of its time just doing floating point exponentiation for no reason. Um, Okay, so a thousand records to records a second, right? I kind of felt like that was slow, um, and then like some of my teammates disagreed with, with me; they were wrong. Um, they were like, "That's fast. A thousand is a lot." And I was like, D "I think it's not a lot," um, and it wasn't a lot. Um, so um, I wanted to like kind of like train my intuitions about like what is fast and what is slow, and we're gonna play a game really quickly. Um, let's find the game. Okay, this is the game. Um, I'm going to read this to you, um, so you don't have to read it. Uh, so uh, this is in Python. Uh, so let's say I have a dictionary, an empty dictionary, and then I just like put numbers in that dictionary. So like I add new entries. How many entries do you think you can add to this dictionary in one second? A million? OK, let's see. 10, 11 million. That's so many, <laughs> right? And people say Python is slow. <laughs> you can put 11 million entries in a dictionary in a second. Uh, we could do another one. Um, this is one where you parse an HTTP request. So I have some HTTP request here that I wrote. Um, and the request parsing is all in Python. So how many HTTP requests do you think you can parse in a second? You have to guess something. 100,000? OK. You're right. It's 25,000, which is close enough. Um, the goal is just not to be off by more than 10 times, um, right? Because <laughs> you have 1 to 1 billion. Um, and it's often, I think, really not obvious. Um, maybe we could do one more. Oh, we can download a web page. That one's kind of cheating. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. How many times can you run Python? Like, how many times can you, like, start the Python interpreter in a second? <laughs> One? OK, we'll see. Let's see. No, it's more. It's actually 77, um, which is substantially more than one, uh, <laughs> I would argue. Uh, but also substantially less than, like, a million, right? <laughs> So I, I, I feel like it's kind of useful to get intuitions for some of these things and just to be like, okay, I think I could do, it's like more like a hundred than a million, right? Like, um, yeah. And if you're just like adding two numbers and it's only doing it a thousand times, 
It's probably something wrong. OK, um, so now we know about computers being fast. Um, you can also play this game or like tell your coworkers. Um, I think it's good to give it to people who are like arrogant, because like everyone gets it really wrong. <laughs> Um, I still make mistakes, and I wrote the game, <laughs> so uh, I think it's really fun. Um, another thing that's useful for debugging, of course, is to like know your debugging toolkit. And because when you're debugging, you often like ask a lot of questions of your computer, right? Like you're like, is it like maybe a network request isn't working, and you're like, okay, is the request getting to the server or not, right? Like, did it ever make it off my computer? Um, and like having good debugging tools can help you answer those questions. Um, I have a zine about debugging tools for Linux that I love. It has a cute penguin on the cover. It's on my website. Um, and uh, it talks about some useful debugging tools that you can use on Linux. Um, and then, as I said before, the main thing I think about debugging is that I learned to like debugging. Um, and I have realized that I learned things, and it's kind of interesting. Um, OK, uh, how are we doing for time? I don't know. Does that mean that we're done? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That means we can skip to the end. Oh, this is the, my talk title in Chinese. Uh, thank you. <laughs> this is the advantage of having unconnected sections in your talk. Because <laughs> you can just be like, those ones won't happen. <laughs> uh, do you have questions? Yes. Oh. OK, this is a good question. It's like, how do you find people to ask your questions to? Hmm. I mostly ask questions of my coworkers, but I also question, ask questions of random people on the internet. I think for that, it's good to ask like yes or no questions sometimes. Uh, yeah, so it's, this is a good question. It's like, it's like you have someone who you think might have the answer to your questions, but you don't know. You don't know which one to choose. Well, I feel like you have to, you have to choose someone. <laughs> um, but, but actually, I feel, like, I feel like asking exploratory questions is kind of an interesting skill. Because like, I mean, you obviously don't want to like, quiz people, right? <laughs> um, but like, I, sometimes I have like, an area of questions that I'm interested in, and I, haven't, and I haven't found anyone to answer my question yet. Um, so maybe I'll have some like, standard starter questions I start with, and then I just ask that question to a lot of people, and I see if anyone gives me an answer to it. And, or I'll like, yeah. Does that make sense? You get referrals then. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. You, sometimes yeah. And I feel like it helps to have a really good question, too. Like, or a question which is like, maybe kind of like clickbaity, or like, where someone is like, oh, I want to know that too, right? Like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, because so some questions you'll ask someone and then they'll be like, I don't care. And some questions you'll ask someone and they're like, wait. Like, <laughs> and they'll like join you on your mission. <laughs> so I feel like it's good to have questions which make you, people want to join you on your mission <laughs> to find the answer. Um, Yes. Um, I, like, my personal pet peeve is always falling into that rabbit hole of there is that problem where, you know, it's like it comes from like, like dedicated relationship. Why is that? And yet, you know, you know, the organization you belong to kind of, you know, did you have to find yourself kind of realizing what is that learning process of becoming a leader? Yeah, it's, yeah. So this is, 
Okay, so the question is like, how do you, like do you sometimes like get lost in a rabbit hole? Or maybe also like, how do you choose your battles of like which edge case you're going to like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, so I feel like for that, it helps to have like an area of focus where you're like, this is like the world of things that I'm interested in. So for example, like uh, I work on this thing, on this Kubernetes thing, and I work on trying to make sure that that system is like really reliable. Um, so if I run into like a Kubernetes bug, I'll often, I'm more likely to be like, this is important, I'm gonna investigate it. But if it's something like outside of my like, box of things that I'm currently paying attention to, then I'm like, okay, well, we'll let that one go <laughs> for now. Does that make sense? Or I don't know if that's helpful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's really hard when you're like more of a generalist. Because I said I feel like it's hard when you're being more of a generalist and when you're like touching a lot of things because it's like it's impossible to learn about everything all at once. Yeah. I think I'm just agreeing that this is hard. <laughs> oh, I, <don't> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I have I have no wisdom. <laughs> right now I get to specialize a little bit, which is more which makes it easier.